for joining us for this contemporary military forum entitled Positional Advantage, Land Power in the Indo-Pacific. I am Lieutenant General Retired Pat McQuistian, a USA Senior Fellow, although I don't really like either of those <laughs> senior or fellow. But as your professional association, AUSA is proud to provide forums like this one throughout the year that broaden the knowledge base of our Army and the professionals who serve and those who support. AUSA amplifies the U.S. Army's narrative to audiences inside and outside the Army with the stated mission to be a voice for the Army and support for the soldier. Of course, we cannot do this alone. AUSA relies on its members to help tell the Army's story and to support our soldiers and their families. A strong membership base is vitally important to advocacy efforts in Congress, the Pentagon, and throughout the defense industrial base, and to the public and communities throughout AUSA's 122 chapters within the United States and nine other countries. All right, so show of hands here. Who's a member of AUSA? <laughs> That's pretty darn good. Okay, for those who raised their hands, we thank you. <laughs> for everyone else, unless you opted out when you registered for the annual meeting, you are now a new basic, no-cost member of AUSA, and thank you. If you would like to become a premium member and elevate your member benefits, please visit the AUSA member zone located on the L Street Bridge near Halls D&E &E, or sign up online at AUSA.org. AUSA is a membership organization, and membership matters. We can't do it without you. You help us be an effective voice for the Army and provide for, uh, support for soldiers, civilians, and families. In appreciation for participation in the panel today, all the panel members receive just a small gift from AUSA, which is an umbrella which I will not open in the room, <laughs> and hopefully we will not need those throughout the uh, symposium. So, I am now going to turn it over to uh, Major General Retired Jeff Smith, Vice President, Business Development, L3 Harris. Good afternoon, everyone. Afternoon. All right, you got a little good spun up here. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, Jeff. everyone. Good afternoon, Jeff. Good afternoon, Jeff. <laughs> Look, it's a, a great honor. I, I have a very small task, which is to introduce a good friend of mine, Pete Gallagher. Uh, but I want to take a, a few moments up front uh, just to thank everybody for their participation, for coming in. Uh, this association uh, does amazing things for uh, all of its members, for the United States Army, and for our country. So for that, AUSA, thank you very much. I, I had the honor of serving for 32 years as an airborne infantryman and uh, the distinct honor of serving with three of these folks up here on stage in uniform. And I, I could think of no better group to talk to you today than uh, the group up here. So it's uh, very exciting to see that. As, as General McQuistian mentioned, I'm with L3 Harris uh, Technologies. Uh, we've been partnered with the U.S. Army for over six decades uh, in just about everything you can think of. I'm not up here to talk uh, business, but it really reflects you know, who you see out here in these halls. It's, it's one nation working together. Uh, it takes, uh, everyone's responsible for national security, whether you're in uniform or out of uniform. So it really is an honor to be here and be part of this. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Major General Retired Pete Gallagher, and Pete's gonna guide this, uh, this group out of here. So thank you all very much for coming out, and I'm sure uh, that you're gonna hear some wise uh, words today from this panel. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Hey. As Jeff said, Major General Retired Pete Gallagher, I have the privilege of working for a company called CACI International. I have uh, um, have the distinct pleasure, actually, of, of moderating this panel with a good couple of good friends of mine. Uh, and and uh, I would like to talk through the panel uh, and, and who, who we have here. I think you all know, but General Charlie Flynn, Commander of, uh, Commanding General of U.S. Army Pacific. We've got Lieutenant General Chris Leneve, the Commanding General of 8th U.S. Army, and we're uh, blessed to have with us Congressman Rob Whitman from the great state of Virginia, a member of the House Armed Services Committee. All right, we're going to, the topic, as, as General McQuistian said, it's positional advantage, land power in the Indo-Pacific. Land power is enduring. Land power provides strength. It pulls the entire joint community together. And within the Indo-Pacific region, with the joint challenges 
that, are, that we're faced with, the Army is the linchpin. And the Strategic Land Power Network that General Flynn has been working on for his entire tour there as the Commanding General of U.S. Army Pacific is really to merge the capabilities and pull together partners in the region to make sure that we don't have to go to war. Okay, the, the biggest thing here, the Army's vital role is providing decisive land power and what's called integrated deterrence of the joint force across all of the Indo-Pacific region. Now, the Army's critical contributions are the, to that integrated deterrence is really made possible through the joint multinational training exercises, the training and readiness, whether it's jungle warfare, Arctic warfare, pulling the coalition together and working with allies and partners across the region. The U.S. Army Pacific contributes to the free and open Indo-Pacific by leading multi-domain transformation, applying land power for maximum effect, and the most consequential region in America's future. And they do that through organizing, generating, applying, and building land power across the Indo-Pacific. And so with that, I'm going to allow each one of the members of this panel to spend a little bit of time sharing their perspective. We'll start first with General Flynn. Sir. Pete, thanks. And uh, thanks to AUSA for giving us this platform. And uh, thanks to uh, Chris and uh, Rhett Whitman for, uh, for being here again uh, this year to talk. Um, listen, I'll, uh, I'm going to take about seven to ten minutes and, uh, and talk about um, some things that are important, uh, but there's probably nothing more important than me opening up uh, and discussing the threats that are, uh, that are in the region. And uh, today is an important day to talk about that because the things that are actually going in and around Taiwan and what uh, China is doing around Taiwan, but the problem is bigger than that. The problem is much bigger than that. And you see that we have a limited regional war in Europe right now. We have a limited regional war going on in the Middle East right now. And the last thing that we can afford is another limited regional war out in Asia. And uh, I, I point that out because, you know, our highest duty out there is to deter what's happening. And positional advantage is about getting in the right position to prevent that from happening and be in a position to take time and space away and to be able to counter the incremental, uh, insidious, and irresponsible, now irresponsible, path that the Chinese have been on for uh, the better part of two decades. I have had the uh, privilege of being able to spend literally the last eight out of 11 years in that region, and I can tell you that uh, the way they're operating today in 2024 is vastly different than the way they were operating in 2014. And uh, Director Ray recently said, you know, there are 50 to 1 cyber hackers from China compared to what we have. So they're in, they're in the cyber domain. The proliferation in the space domain by the Chinese is extraordinary. 200% more shipbuilding capacity than the United States. Largest army in the world. Largest rocket force in the world. They reorganized in 2015. They're reorganizing today. And the scale by which they're exercising out there is significant. And it's not just in the East China Sea. It's not just in the Taiwan Strait. It's not just in the Phil Sea. It's throughout the region. It's in South Asia. It's out in Oceania, the pressure that's against ASEAN countries. I always refer to uh, even in the Arctic, the Russians are in the Arctic Circle looking out. The Chinese are outside the Arctic Circle looking in. And we sort of have a foot astride each of it. So the pressures in each one of these areas and the ability for them to project uh, the arsenal that they have built is extraordinary. Two points I'll leave you with before I start talking about the things that we are doing. The two points are this. There are three things that the Chinese have that we do not have. They are operating on interior lines. They are 100 miles, 110 miles from there, one of their objectives, Taiwan. Okay, that's less than the distance from the island of Oahu to the big island in, uh, uh, to uh, the Pohakaloa training area on the big island. The second thing they have is mass. They have a lot of everything. And then the third thing they have is magazine depth. 
So we have to counter against those three advantages that they have. Now, there is a disadvantage that they have. The primary uh, means of their attack approach with their A2 AD arsenal is against a strength of the United States. That strength is in the air and in the maritime domains. The secondary reason their A2 AD arsenal was designed was to counter other strengths of ours in cyber and space. However, that A2 AD arsenal was not designed to find, fix, and finish land-based forces that are distributed, dispersed, mobile, reloadable, networked, and they are operating together, rehearsing with one another, and have degrees of interoperability that that adversary does not have. This is an advantage for us. And this is about positional advantage, because if we get into a positional advantage in every corridor out there, the northern corridor, central corridor, southern corridor, and western corridor, uh, then we can take time and space away from the adversary's actions and empower and enable and create that strategic land power network that I'm talking about. Here's a couple of facts. The Japanese army is 65% of its military. The Philippine military, 70% of that military is its army. They actually have more divisions than the United States Army. India, 80% of its military army. Malaysia, 75% of its military army. Indonesia, 75% of its military army. The point I'm making here is a lot of people look at that map and they see blue and they think air and maritime. The reality of it is the region is defined by armies. And this is the power of the strategic land power network as a great counterweight to what the Chinese are doing. And you can know, you, we cannot cede any domain out there. We have to win in all five domains, and we have to win as a joint force. We have to win as a joint, combined, and multinational force. That's the only way to prevent the continuation of their incremental, insidious, and now irresponsible behavior. How are we doing that? Positional advantage. This is the ends. The four ways we're doing that is organizing. And we have to organize tailored, Battle, a battle-winning mix of capabilities, primarily in Hawaii, Joint Base Lewis-McChord, and Alaska, to then generate that land power and bring it into the region. And how are we generating their land power? We're doing it through the Joint Pacific Multinational Readiness Center, the first combat training center that the U.S. Army has built in more than 50 years. It's got a Hawaii campus, got an Alaska campus, there's obvious differences between the conditions and the environments between the eight island archipelago tropic jungle surrounded by joint assets as there are up in the Alaska campus of high altitude extreme cold weather mountainous surrounded by joint assets. So what are we doing there? We're generating readiness through the use of the land power network and then we're applying that into the region through Operation Pathways. Operation Pathways is the very definition of campaigning. That is the logical and sequential arrangement of more than 40 army to army and joint exercises that meet the national security objectives of the United States, and here's a key, those of our allies and partners. That is the very definition of campaigning. So we're organizing battle winning mix of tailored forces against the threats, we're generating Readiness through our training at the Joint Pacific Multinational Readiness Center, of which there's a Hawaii campus, Alaska campus, and then there's an exportable version that we brought into Australia to their training center, brought it into the Philippines last year, into Fort Magsaysay, bringing it in again this year. We put it into Indonesia twice before. Korea has KCTC. Japan has a training center on the island of Hokkaido. So there's an exportable version of this where we can actually bring the training center to the region. Why do, uh, why do they like the training center in the region? Well, most of these army leaders have been to our schools, and most of them have been to our training centers. So they're familiar with our education and our training and our leader development. This is an important point. 65% of all IMET seats that the Department of State distributes are army seats and army schools. We have a huge influence on the region through the land power network. So organize, generate, 
and then we're applying it, and then the last way of supporting positional advantage is building joint interior lines. We have to create interior lines, why? Because we have to have operational reach. We've got to get off exterior lines on interior lines. If we're on interior lines, then we can build operational endurance, we can build strategic reach. Why? Because we want to be a counterweight to what's going on in the region. That expression of their A2AD arsenal in the air domain, in the maritime domain, in the space and cyber domain has to be countered by the strategic land power network. And those joint interior li lines are made up of four foundational capabilities that only the Army provides at scale and at echelon. That is command and control, protection, collection, and sustainment. Command and control because there is no other C2 node in the U.S. military inventory like a core and a division headquarters. The MEF is not like a core. A core is unique and a division is unique. It can see to complex uh, multinational combined and interagency operations for extended periods of time. Protection, this is engineering, mobility, counter-mobility, survivability, it's medical for ourselves and our partners, and it's also integrated air and missile defense and the things that we're doing at, from counter UAS to counter cruise missile to mid-tier to upper tier with Patriot and THAAD is extraordinary and there's advances being made there. Sustainment, Army pre-position stocks, joint theater distribution, composite watercraft company and Army watercraft systems, distribution of material, contracting command, all of these things are so important to what we're doing and then collection. We have to have a balanced layer of collection between the terrestrial layer, the aerial layer, and the space layer. And I would argue that for many, many years, we're over-invested in the aerial layer and over-invested in the space layer in the Indo-Pacific. We have to have a terrestrial collection layer. And that is a series of sensors that can both collect in all domains to include open source and share that with our partners. So the last part of this is a really important part because we have to do it with the consent and with the invitation of our allies and partners in the region. And again, this is where the strategic land power network is so important as a counterweight to the aggressive behavior that's happening in the region. The last point I'd make here is this. In my near 40 years of doing this, I have never seen the North Koreans, the Chinese, and the Russians matched up, and whether they have signed an agreement or a document that says they're going, that that they aim to do this in written form, they are absolutely working together. They're absolutely working together, and you can see it, as I mentioned earlier, there's North Korean soldiers that are now on the battlefield in Europe. They're exchanging hard power, they're exchanging soft power, and they're exchanging technology. This is a very, very dangerous combination that we all should pay very, very close attention to. Again, there's a limited regional war going on in Europe. There's a limited regional war going on in the Middle East. We can ill afford another limited regional war in Asia. Why? Because it will be a global problem for all of us. So everything that we do, everything that we do has to be towards preventing that from happening. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thank you, General Flynn. All right, we'll take it down to the, to the, to the peninsula here, and we'll give uh, Lieutenant General Chris Leneve the opportunity to kind of peek to, to speak to you from a field commander's perspective. So Chris, over to you, sir. Okay, first off, uh, to AUSA and the, and the team, thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me, <coughs> sir. Sir, it's, it's an honor to be on the Thank panel you. with you. Thank you here with you. So, uh, 8th Army, it's our only field army. And people ask me all the time, what is a field army? It's core like it's the only one we have. It sets the theater. It does everything a core would do uh, in order to get uh, forces ready. What's important of us over there? Okay, we are the only large U.S. land power that has its feet every single day in Asia. So positional advantage, yes. Is it important? Yes. Years ago, if I was a young captain in the advanced course, I'd say it's a foothold, and a foothold causes your adversaries to do something differently because of you. And for 71 years, for 71 years, the Alliance, we're partnered with an incredible, incredible teammate with, uh, with the Rocks, 
That alliance has done an incredible job of deterrence, but it's not just deterring for that homeland anymore, based off the capabilities that our adversaries have. We're defending two homelands with our feet on the ground in Asia, and it's incredibly important. And if you ever wonder the commitment, the true commitment, I'd give you just two statistics real fast. Our only Ford deployed and Ford stationed division in the United States Army sits in Korea. It's also our only combined division, fully combined with our allies. And my headquarters is combined as well at the three-star level. Incredibly important. Right? I wear multiple hats, all of them from a land power perspective. And what we have to do there is critical. And it's not just focused north. It's focused in all the directions we need to be for the threats that we face. And it's not the Korea of 20 plus years ago where if it went over there, it stayed over there. We're projecting the alliance at every opportunity that we can. So 10 plus uh, events this year alone uh, incorporating forces into the pathways, whether it's aviation, uh, air defense, medical, and we're doing it with our allies as well. So incredibly important uh, team that we have there, and it's something that's gonna be critical for us as we move forward to try to counter the threats that we all face. Thank you. All right, Representative Whitman, sir, over Very to good. you. Well, Major General Gallagher, thank you so much. And thank you to AUSA for, for putting this uh, forum on. What a great opportunity. And you, you hear the challenge that we face. And listen, the, the Army is the key component in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, as General Flynn talked about, critical pathways are going to be key operation pathways. You see, too, what's happening with 8th Army, what they are going to do as the enabler there in a multi-domain task force. Our job as members of Congress is to look at these, these concepts of operation and figure out what do we do to make sure the Army has all the tools necessary to make sure that they can execute. This is a challenging uh, scenario here because, as, we, as, we, as you've heard, we have limited conflicts in other areas of the world. And what's going to happen in the Indo-Pacific is very different than the other areas of the world. That means we have to have lots of capabilities here. We, we talk about uh, long-range precision fires. That's great, but you know what? When you look at sustaining that, what do you have to do? You've got to have magazine depth. And it's not just any magazine depth. It has to be long-range capability there. We have to make sure, too, we get to the fundamentals of that. You know, we've looked at this and said, what do we need to do to make sure we have that? You know, we've done a great job through the years in precision. You know, our weapons can hit exactly where they're supposed to be. The question is, is how do we make sure we extend range and lethality? That means energetics. So we've been really focused on what do we do to modernize energetics to make sure we're keeping up with our adversaries. Because, by the way, looking at what's happening in the Indo-Pacific, the challenge that General Flynn and General Leneve deal with every day is range and lethality. If they, if they can hold you off at longer distances and our weapons uh, systems have the ability to operate, that's not a good scenario. So, so you, you look, at the, look at those WES, those weapon engagement zones, and you go, wow, this is a really, really difficult calculus that we have to solve. I, I want to make sure that we're doing things to provide that, that not only modernization, but make sure we're providing that magazine depth. Another element, too, is enhanced mobility. How are we going to move around? You know, logistics is key in that theater. I mean, and, and history teaches us that. You know, uh, General Omar Bradley had it right. He said, tactics are for amateurs, logistics are for professionals. I mean, he knew the way to sustain a force is through logistics. You've got to be able to move things around. Listen, the Army is that hub. The Army has, I've been there to Fort Eustis, and Fort Eustis does an incredible job with what they have to make sure we get logistics right. The key with that is scale. How do we make sure we have the scale necessary to operate against that tyranny of distance? That takes a lot of capability. It takes a lot of ships, uh, Army ships, by the way, and making sure we have two soldiers to go on those ships. I mean, that's, in, that's key as well as, as well as mariners. We have to be able to do that, and we have to generate that capability and capacity at the speed of relevance. Listen, we don't have years to do this. You know, we want to make sure that we deter. Our first effort is to deter. And if called upon when we engage, better be careful because we're going to kick your ass. But if, we, if not, we, we want to make sure that we ensure that we don't have to get there. But if we do, watch out. Watch out. The other element, too, is as we see what's unfolding around the world in these limited, in these limited spaces where warfare is occurring, you look at what's happening. Uh, UAS, uncrewed systems, that is the future. Counter UAS, that is the future. Listen, we have to really get on the stick with that and make sure we are modernizing at the speed of relevance. 
Those things are significant. Listen, we've got great capability here in this country. We are the best innovators and creators in the world. We have to kind of change our mindset because the military through the years has always been focused on hardware. And listen, har hardware is an important part of it, but the world of tomorrow is defined by software. Software is the enabler. You know, we can find the hardware, but you got to make sure you get the software right in order to enable it. And we have to make sure, too, we understand how do we acquire software? It's a different acquisition strategy than acquiring hardware. We go through writing, writing requirements and those things. This is a dynamic acquisition. So you got to move away from cost plus to firm fixed price and understand as part of that contract, it's going to be purchasing not just the software, but par purchasing the upgraded uh, parts of that software that happen on a continual basis at the speed of relevance. All those things are, I think are critically important. Our effort is to make sure that we're there to enable General Flynn and General Lanier to make sure that they can modernize at the speed of relevance. We don't, we, don't have, we don't have the luxury of doing this over a long period of time. And we understand the sort of the static nature of acquisition as it exists today. We can't do that anymore. We cannot do that anymore where it takes years and years to write requirements, to go through RFPs, to go through the procurement process, to go fielding those systems, to get to IOC. And by the time they get out there, you look at it and your adversary already has counters to that. And you look at it and go, wow, we, we, we got to be faster at this. We have to be more agile, more flexible. That's where we are. That's Congress's job is to make sure that we enable uh, what these two great military leaders here do on a daily basis. And that's figure out this calculus on what we need to do to deter the Chinese and for that matter, uh, other uh, bad actors in the area like <coughs> North Korea, like Russia, and make sure that they all wake up each morning. I want Vladimir Putin, Kim Jong-un, and Xi Jinping to wake up every morning and go, mm, no, not, not today, not today. I appreciate you saying we kick ass too. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Congressman Whitman. Well, as you can see, just by the opening comments of our panel members, the Indo-Pacific is clearly the most consequential region in modern history. And we're going to take a shot at, at some questions and answers now. Uh, I've got a few questions. And then uh, I do, we do have question cards, right? If you have cards, raise your hand. Get your cards to the, to, to the mighty major in the back there. And uh, we'll, we'll answer your questions as we get them. Uh, the first question uh, I've got to get started is uh, for General Flynn. Uh, sir, it's been a minute since uh, you know, 1997 when Major Gallagher and Major Flynn, both brand new uh, majors, showed up at 25th Infantry Division, yeah. Tropic Lightning. As uh, you, know, you began a journey, I guess, back then, you know, who would have thought you know, that I'd be the guy in a coat and tie and you'd be a four-star general <laughs> kind of leading the most consequential <laughs> region <laughs> in the Pacific or in the nation. But, but those were interesting times, but That's that began sure. a, a I would say over a decade plus yeah. uh, of uh, Charlie Flynn assignments into this most consequential region, and things happen for a reason. And so, sir, I, I, I guess that's a rarity in, in today's Army. A lot of folks have spent a lot of time in Afghanistan and Iraq, which General Flynn has as well, but not as many general officers have had as many assignments, I think, in this region as you. And as you're, you know, this being probably your last AUSA, I would say, oh, it is. as a four-star leader. <laughs> oh, uh, first of all, before he answers the question, General Flynn will be uh, turning over the reins in a little, about, a little, about a month or so. 8 November. So let's give him a round of applause. This is his last AUSA. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, those were the days. <laughs> right. So I would say, sir, just the, the simple question is, what reflections do you have based on all the time you spent in that region yeah. uh, where, you know, I, I would say the value and contributions of land forces is probably not as intuitive as maybe it is in the Europe or the Middle East? Yep. Um, well, I guess the first point I'd make is, uh, uh, so, when Pete and I were there in the late, I mean, I left in 2000 and I came back in 2014. And I remember uh, I actually spent, when I, after I was told I was going out there, I spent uh, three days at DIA. And I remember getting stuck in traffic, driving back to Fort Bragg at the time uh, to pack my family and go out to the 25th. And I got caught down there in the mixing bowl for like an hour and a half in traffic. <laughs> and, I, and it dawned on me that you know, I knew a lot about you know Kandahar and Kabul and uh, and Baghdad and you know those two things that we were doing for the last 14 years, but I realized 
how much I had missed uh, about what was actually happening out in Asia and with, with China and uh, specifically, and North Korea, but definitely with China. And so um, I just remember sitting in traffic and thinking, man, I have a ton to learn. And so going back out there and never really thinking that, you know, I was going to spend the, the majority of my time as a, as a two and, well, all of my time really as a two star and then as a four star out in that uh, region. And, uh, and I guess the, the dramatic difference between what I immersed myself and saw in 14 compared to what I see now in 2024, 20, almost 25. That trajectory, ladies and gentlemen, that is a very, very dangerous trajectory, okay? So absent us slowing that down, that is not an outcome we seek, okay? No one builds that kind of arsenal to merely defend, okay? So that is a dangerous path that uh, China is on. And again, in my comments earlier, uh, on what's actually changed. Um, when I came back in 21 as the commander of U.S. Army Pacific, just going back again, 15 they reorganized, they built training centers, they created regional commands, they began to set up their own training centers, and so I come back in 21, and that path had accelerated. And then here we are in 24 on the way to 25, and you can see what they can put uh, on the ground, you can see what they put in the air, you can see what they put at sea, and you can see what they're doing in the cyber and space domain. My point here is really this, is that in our history, at one point we had to make a choice between the European theater and, and Asia. And at that point, particularly in that century, Europe was the most consequential theater to the United States and to freedom and prosperity. I would argue that this century is going to be defined by the relationship between the United States and China in Asia. The people are in Asia. The population is in Asia. The global GDP is in Asia. The point I'm making is the difference between when you and I were there in the late 90s and today is stark and it's concerning and everybody should be very concerned about the path it's on. And this is where US leadership is so important in that region. And I argue, and my theory of the case, is that it is a joint theater. It's going to require joint solutions. And we are a vital part of the joint force. And I know Admiral Paparo, the uh, Indo-PACOM commander, realizes and recognizes the value of what land forces provide in that region. Chris Leneve talked about it, Congressman Whitman talked about it. There are capabilities at scale and at echelon that only the Army provides the joint force. Here's a couple of facts. I mentioned them earlier. The theater is defined by armies. <laughs> armies are the force they turn to to protect their territorial integrity and defend their national sovereignty. Why? Because they're the largest force in these countries. And when I talk about the strategic land power network, I'm talking about the US Army, I'm talking about the US Marine Corps, I'm talking about special operations forces, and I'm talking about the large armies that are in the region. US Army Pacific is 25% of the US Army and when we get rotating forces out there, it's anywhere between about 27 and 30% of the total U.S. Army. And that includes Guard and Reserve. Okay? We are a large force. I mean, the U.S. Marine Corps, 40% of the U.S. Marine Corps is fixed-wing air. They have no more tanks, they have no more bridges, and they reduced 70% of their tubed artillery. The U.S. Army is a land power and it is the central land force in Asia that ties this strategic land power network together. And it is vitally important that we play that role as a counterweight to what's happening out there. And I guess to your question, Pete, the difference that I see is I believe, and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful, there's a renewed recognition 
in the centrality of land power in the Indo-Pacific. One final point. This week, uh, on the 17th of this week, 17th of October, MacArthur will return to Leyte in October of 41. Okay? Two and a half years, if you just say January 19, it took us two and a half years to get back to that place in the Philippines. We cannot give up that terrain. We can never lose the terrain that we and our allies and partners own today. We cannot cede that space because the price in blood and treasure to get it back is not worth it. That would be just a terrible, terrible outcome. Therefore, that's why positional advantage in the Pacific and in the Indo-Pacific and in and around the Asian continent, the Australian continent, and the land archipelago bridge that connects those two continents, that's why those interior lines are so important. That's why campaigning through Operation Pathways is so important. That's why it's so important to generate readiness in the region. Think about this for a minute. For more than 50 years, we were sending forces from Alaska and Hawaii to training centers in the continental United States. I know. Why would we ever do that? We didn't do it with forces in Europe. We should have never done that. And I'm very, very proud of the training center that we have out there, and we're connected to the training center in Japan, in Korea, now in Indonesia, Australia, the Philippines. This is really, really important. Really important. So these are the differences between when you and I were out there in the late 90s and what we're doing today. And it's a powerful message to the region. The combination of these four things is integrated deterrence. Capability, posture, messaging, and will. We have to have capability forward. We have to improve our posture every day. We have to message what the hell we're doing out there. And then we've got to demonstrate the will by being forward with our allies and partners and demonstrating U.S. leadership in the region through the binding together of the strategic land power network, which is the, that is the strategic uh, 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 network that's going to bind that region together and keep those relationships um, strong, tight, so freedom and prosperity can be achieved by all. All right, the next question, General Leneve. You can Lene tell I get a little passionate I about it. I couldn't tell, I couldn't tell. There's no passion. Uh, General Leneve, I think General Flynn made it crystal clear about the importance of land power, uh, not only in the entire Indo-PACOM region, but specifically on the peninsula in Korea. I'm going to focus on the relationships that he hit on. And really, with 8th Army, I think you, you foster one of the America's closest alliances yeah. with the, uh, the Republic of Korea and the U.S. alliance there. Can you elaborate on more on how important that really is to your mission in, in, on the peninsula. Yeah. Well, quick answer, it's the cornerstone of everything we do. And I was just thinking uh, of the, the two of you. Um, <laughs> Don't even think about that. <laughs> no, and uh, th the way that the uh, AIM process works for general officers now, I've never served in the Pacific, so it's, I'm a first time offender. And I wish, uh, you know, going back, I wish I would have put my feet uh, into this a long time ago. Um, but, you know, God always has the path. So uh, it's been a fast process to learn uh, of all the, the, the different uh, components uh, out here. But when you look at, when you look at the, the map for indo -PACOM, you, all, you think sometimes Korea is like, well, over there, We're right in the middle. Mm -hmm. It's just, a, it, yeah. you know, it's how, how you look at it. Yeah. Our, our uh, work with, uh, with the rocks are... I mean, it's the cornerstone of everything. I talked about it a little bit before. 71 years. 71 years this uh, alliance has worked, the armistice has worked, and it's because of the commitment of both countries together. And it's a commitment to share. It's a commitment to train together. It's a commitment uh, in order to uh, man positions together. It, we're fully integrated uh, in uh, you know, some of our headquarters. But it goes uh, even uh, deeper than that. There is a, an understanding now uh, that they also have to project uh, the alliance uh, in order to, um, you know, get TTPs back into uh, the pen. I mean, it, you get so much when you go off into some of these training events, but what you bring back uh, and bring back for the alliance for all of us to learn from is critically important. What I will tell you is uh, also coming to the pen, it's not a readiness, uh, you know, 
uh, burnout. It's a, it's a readiness building machine uh, over there that we do with our, our partners uh, every single day. Uh, Representative Whitman, what more can Congress do to ensure that the Army has the necessary resources and capabilities to perform its vital role uh, in that theater? And specifically, um, you know, despite comparison between Europe and the Pacific, the fact that the European Defen Deterrence Initiative provides additional funding over the top line, mm -hmm. whereas General Flynn and, and, and uh, you know, commands in the region in the Pacific, uh, the Pacific Deterrence Initiative is really accounts for items in the base budget. So. Yeah. I guess from your perspective there in Congress, what more can be done? Well, listen, the, the Congress needs to be very focused on the magnitude of the threat there. There's things obviously going on in Europe and the Middle East. That's where people's attention is. And while the attention is focused there, don't you believe that our adversaries in the Indo-Pacific are looking at what opportunities may exist there? That's my concern is for them to look at it and go, hey, there's some distraction going on here. Let's continue to do things in their insidious and nefarious way within that theater. So our job is to make sure we're properly resourcing the capability and capacity necessary in the theater. And, and just as General Flynn said, the Army is the land force in that particular region. Land forces are going to have a dominant effect within that region. Land forces are going to have the dominant deterrence effect in the region. So the question is, is how do we make sure in Congress that we are properly resourcing uh, things that are necessary and things that can build capacity and capability quickly? You know, as I said, we have to look at what, what can we do in this short-term window? And, and how do we make sure, too, that we enable decision makers within the Army to say, these are things that we need to get in the hands of the warfighter tomorrow. Listen, I've been very impressed by what General George is doing. I've been out and visited with our division commanders about what's happening there uh, with Army training doctrine within the region, the TTPs that are all about how do we create an effective fighting force there that when called upon, you know, we can do what's necessary there. Or, or in the other scenarios, how do we make sure that we build that capacity quickly to where the Chinese and others say, Wow, that's something that, that, that we don't, don't want to mess with. And that, that has to get us uh, to do things in addition to what's happening right now. You know, we have a lot of legacy systems that we have to look at and go, are these the proper assets that we need going forward? And if they're not, how do we reposition quickly? How do we make sure as we're looking at ramping down legacy systems that we're at the same time simultaneously ramping up replacement systems? How do we modernize? That's why I formed the Defense Modernization Caucus. I mean, we are in a world today that operates at a fast pace. Technology dictates the things that can and can't be done. We have to be able to operate at the speed of relevance. And the speed of relevance doesn't mean taking decades to acquire an exquisite system. Listen, I love exquisite systems, but you know what? It's going to be exquisite systems we have in addition to uh, attributable and expendable systems that are really going to provide the capability and the capacity that's available next month. Uh, next six months, next year, those are the things that the Chinese are going to look at and go, wow, I uh, didn't expect that. And we have to be able to do that across the spectrum. Another thing we have to do, too, is just simple things. I call it the blocking and tackling of supply in the United States Army. How do we create magazine depth? How do we make sure the industrial capacity is there? That takes a little while to spin up, and then how do we sustain that? We've got to get off of this roller coaster ride of saying, hey, we're going to build a bunch of munitions, and then, uh, guess what, everything's okay, and then we let the munitions um, production capability drift off and go, and go, go, go away. We can't, can't have that. How do we make sure, too, we look at logistics? How do we sustain logistics in a contested environment? How do we move, as General Flynn said, we've got to have as much in theater as we can. Because I can tell you when the balloon goes up, you're not, if it ain't there, you don't have it. Because there's no way you're going to be able to fight, fight, that's, fight your way in to bring, to bring that in. So how do we make sure we do that? And how do we make sure, too, in today's theater where we see, the, the, listen, the, the laboratory for what is happening in uncrewed systems is Ukraine. We see that on a daily basis. How do we take the lessons learned there and provide that in the Indo-Pacific with another challenge laid on top of it? So this is UAS and counter UAS in a theater where distance is your challenge. How do we do all of those things? Congress has to make sure we enable the deployment of resources to be there, and Congress has to be able to willing to let go a little bit and say, okay, listen, we're going to give you these dollars. You're going to make the best decision in the short term in order to be able to make these decisions. Congress has to resist the challenge and say, we're going to micromanage you, and I know, I know that's difficult, 
But on the authorization side, we have to say, hey, here are the resources. You, you know what the threat is today, and the threat's going to be different next month and next year. How do we make sure we give you the tools to make sure you can respond to that threat? And the appropriators have to do the same thing. I know sometimes it's counterintuitive to what Congress does, but if we're going to operate the same way the Chinese do, and I want to close with this, the Chinese, when they go to field systems, you know what they start with? They start with a blank sheet of paper. And they just said, Let, let's figure it out. And they make big bets. They make big bets, and they put a lot of resources there. And when they hit that bet, they hit it big. Now, if they miss, they miss big, too. But they start without any sort of impediments. In the United States, when we go to the Department of Defense and said, we want to acquire this, what do you start with? You start by an 1117 sheet of paper that you can't even read the print on there. That's a flow chart about what you have to do in order to acquire things. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not the path for us to be able to have the capability where we can operate at the speed of relevance. It has to change. We have to be able to do that. It has to start there with Congress. Thank you, Representative Whitman. Uh, General Flynn, this is an audience question here. Um, considering a fight with China, and that being a contested fight with potential kinetic and non-kinetic impacts in the U.S., with delays getting into theater, what are we doing to counter that in the Indo-Pacific AOR? Okay, a couple things. Um, so again, we want to get off of exterior lines on interior lines. We want to, we, we need to rehearse uh, every day our strategic movement into theater, but then more importantly, the operational maneuver once we're in theater. So how are we doing that? We're drawn out of stocks in Korea with uh, APS-4, both in Korea and Japan in ways that we had not before, Edrian forces over there, drawing that material out, using that in new and creative ways. One of the points that General and Eve talked about with the rocks uh, recently, they're not just merely protecting the alliance, they're helping project the alliance. So last year for the first time, they actually authorized us the use of our armor capabilities on the on pen, and we deployed those down on Army watercraft to Australia and use those in Talisman Sabre, and then we use that Army watercraft to reposition Australian tanks uh, over to Indonesia for uh, Garuda Shield. And I know Jared Hill, uh, Lieutenant General Helwig, the former great 8th TSC commander and DCOM of Transcom now, is going to help us in the future. But I mean, that kind of, um, that kind of use of prepositioned stocks in creative ways was not what we were doing in years prior. Second part of this is um, the organizational change that I'm talking about. So there's a composite watercraft company that is uh, being built in uh, Yokohama North Docks in Tokyo uh, Bay. You know, and, and we're looking to get a second uh, composite watercraft company in the future, say in 28 or 29, uh, down in Australia. We're trying to fix these watercraft forward in Japan, in the Philippines, in Australia, in Guam, like the Navy are trying to fix forward. I mean, we were bringing our watercraft all the way back to the continental United States, in some cases on the West Coast and through the Panama Canal to the East Coast, just to fix the watercraft. And it's interesting, Army watercraft is a system. It's called an Army watercraft system. It's tugs, it's cranes, it's connectors, it's, it's a, uh, it's bridges, so I mean, th these systems, we have to have them forward, but we have to actually have them out in the Pacific operating. We're leasing, we're working with Futures Command with unmanned um, resupply. They're already, do oil companies use this stuff in the Gulf all the time to go out to oil platforms with unmanned assets. These are new and creative ways that we have to be organizing our material and our commodities, so we're not dragging this stuff across the 6,000 miles of the Pacific Ocean. We have to have these assets forward. They have to be distributed. Uh, we have to use them as commodities while we're out rehearsing and training. And by the way, many of these systems that are forward, like an engineering company set of equipment, fuel distribution, port opening, medical, these are also capabilities that we need to have forward in the event of a natural disaster. Eight out of 10 natural disasters on the planet happen in Asia. So having these assets forward actually give us, if you add fuel, petroleum, medical supplies, water, water purification, you can see where I'm going of the value of having these assets forward 
because we're training all the time uh, forward. So, so this is the notion of being able to create those interior lines, get off of exterior lines, and start relying more on operational maneuver inside the theater. And when I say inside the theater, I'm really talking about from the second island chain to the first island chain, and then, of course, in and throughout South Asia, ASEAN, and up to uh, North and Northeast Asia. One last point I'm going to make here is, and touch on is I talked about composite watercraft companies. We're also putting a composite air defense battalion out into Guam as part of the defense of Guam. This is an important point. These, these organizational adaptations that we've been making out in the Pacific are largely going unnoticed. Security Force Assistance Brigade, composite watercraft companies, composite air defense battalions, theater fires element, theater information advantage, theater strike effects group, and of course the two multi-domain task forces, and the experimenting that is going on with these capabilities. High altitude balloons, deep sensing, ground and terrestrial collection. You know, sustainment locations that are out there are also locations to collect. They're also locations to support. They're also locations to command and control. Again, back to the four foundational capabilities that only the Army provides at scale and at echelon. C2, protection, sustainment, and collection. Those four things. There are 10 general officer commands. 10 general officer commands in Hawaii alone in US Army Pacific. 10. OK, nobody competes with the US Army with command and control. We can go international, joint, and multinational and coalition literally overnight. And those are flag officer commands. So the reorganization that's happening out there and the organizations that are being modified, changed, and adapted to meet the threat. And if you think about the multi-domain task force, that was an O and O and a concept that in 18 and 19, we put an experimental MTO together. Now it's 2024. Well, what's coming? The bent metal is coming, right? Mid-range capability, PRISM, hypersonics, LTAMs, IBCS, uh, composite uh, IFPIC, um, Titan, TLS. So, so actually, these organizations have a four-year head start of the weapon systems and platforms that are coming. That is a huge advantage that the Army has. If we had done just the reverse, which is what we did largely for the global war on terror, all of you know, you got equipment when you got overseas, and you're like, where'd this come from? Who went through the net net for this? What are we supposed to do with this? Right? That's not the, what we're doing out there. These organizations are in front of the equipment, and the equipment is beginning to arrive. So now the organizations have worked all through the human, technical, and procedural interoperability that is a prerequisite before a new weapon system, a new collection capability, a new sustainment capability, a new whatever capability shows up. Now that organization can take those new capabilities position it properly, integrate it properly, and, and do a much, much better job of integrating it with our allies and partners in the region. Thank you, General Flynn. Uh, next question, General Lanave, you talked about the importance of the relations with the, the ROC uh, Army and, and, and how critical it is to your mission. What other unique partner countries uh, are you kind of counting on for your operations there in, on the peninsula? Yeah, so we, we're a component of the United Nations Command there, uh, and United States Forces Korea. So there's there's multiple nations that are part of that uh, command that we are, uh, you know, linked in with. Um, you know that that is uh, a critical component. A critical. Yeah, your your mic. I didn't turn it off. <laughs> you just start yelling. Yeah, there we go. We got got, the, uh, got your mic. Nice. We have multiple nations that are part of Karaoke, the, the United Nations Command uh, that, that I'm one of the components underneath of, uh, underneath uh, United States Forces Korea. All of those are critical capabilities that uh, each you know, country brings into uh, this uh, you know, organization that we all fall under. So it's not just uh, the partnerships that we have with ROCs, but at my level, at 8th Army level, it's deeply tied with, uh, with the rocks uh, on our exercises, 
uh, on day-to-day uh, -day, uh, operations and then uh, in the, the major exercises we do twice a year, the higher level exercises at, at, at the, uh, you know, the national level, those two exercises alone trigger multiple exercises throughout the year that, that gets after the training of uh, both of the, the forces. I'll tell you, you know, one part of the year, uh, we'll do a, a warfighter for our uh, U.S. Army Division. The following year, we do a warfighter for one of the ROC divisions, so we stay critically tied to each other uh, for the alliance. Thanks, General Leneve. Uh, Representative Whitman, how do you view the role of, I mean, obviously we've heard about the role of land power in Indo-Pacific and how critical it is. Uh, what advice, I guess, from the legislative branch would you provide to Army senior leaders on how best to advocate for the resourcing that they urgently need? Well, I think the easiest thing to do is to talk about what's necessary to counter the threat in the Indo-Pacific. And I think people are getting, are, are getting closer to getting it today. They understand you know, what the Chinese Communist Party is bringing to the table, what they intend to do in theater. They also know that relationships with other countries are key. So operating not just as a joint force, but as a multinational force there is going to be key. Uh, what we have to do is to talk to them about, you know, how do we make sure we provide the right capability? How do we modernize at the speed of relevance? You know, that tyranny of distance is a big deal, making sure, too, we have the ability to, to, to operate within that realm and for folks to understand, you know, what is the impact of land power in the region? I think a lot of folks think, uh, General Flynn, as you said, lots of blue out there. What does that mean for the Army? Well, the Army is, as you said, is, is that land power in the region. It is the predominant force in the region, especially, too, if you look at our partners there. So, so the question is, how do we make sure people understand what do we need to do to enable the Army? How do we make sure we provide them capability and capacity that is there for their use in the very short term? Because as we know, 2027 is when G says he wants his force to be ready. Doesn't necessarily mean that he's gonna use it then, but he said that's when he wants it to be ready. So the question is, is what do we do at the same pace as they are readying their force to make sure our force is ready at the same realm. So I think people will understand that. And then two, to, to kind of get an idea about, you know, the basic elements. We know we have to be able to, uh, to connect. So we know enhanced mobility is going to be key. That's, that's an Army role. We know, too, that UAS counter UAS, that's going to be a key. We know that operating uh, in, in that close space, in that highly contested environment is going to be key. And Army is going to be the enabler to do that. So our job is to make sure we communicate with folks out there what's necessary to get that done, and how do we make sure we use those resources that are always going to be challenged moving forward. How do we make sure we best use those resources? And how do we help the Army, too, be able to modernize and be able to restructure its force in order to be able to meet, meet that, that challenge? Uh, that's, our, that's our job is to make sure we communicate that. Why, are we, why is Congress doing the things that it's doing in order to enable the Army? That is critically important. And I think, too, people, people understand that. I think when you, when you boil it down to saying this is what we can do to most effectively deter the Chinese, I think that's what people want us to do. I think that's how they want their tax dollars to be used. I think they want us to enable you know, our land power forces, Army being right there at the forefront. How do we enable things like operational pathways and others to have what we need to make sure we can deter and then when called upon, uh, win in a, in a uh, contested environment. I'll, I'll uh, if you don't mind, Pete, yeah, I'll, I'd like to up. follow up on uh, Congressman. Um, I think uh, I mentioned this earlier. The uh, you know training, I think, is a uh, really important element of what we provide to the other armies in the region. I'll give you a, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, the Philippines recently uh, bought the uh, Brahmos uh, missile system. Uh, the Japanese uh, have the uh, Type 12 system. So these, these countries are investing in capabilities because of the threats that they're confronted with. And like us, those investments, um, they're trying to capitalize on those investments. So there's already a, uh, a shared space there between um, how to employ these systems, uh, how to maintain these systems, uh, the, uh, the training uh, backbone that you have to uh, get leaders at all levels to 
operate these systems. And I think, again, back to the uh, Joint Pacific Multinational Readiness Center, the Hawaii and, uh, and uh, Alaskan campus. In fact, I see General Hilbert out the 11th Airborne Commander. He just jumped in from, what, a seven-hour in-flight rig from Alaska into Hawaii uh, through the great help of Transcom. And at the same time, we put a force uh, out of Hawaii uh, and flew them out to Palau, an island on the second island chain, with some HIMARS, uh, and did a uh, basically an airfield seizure and a high rain uh, uh, shot off of, off of Palau. And, and in fact, in the Secretary's remarks this morning, that was an automated launcher last year that we fired with a Prism 1. So the point I'm making is that when we combine the training that we're doing in the region and then the uh, opportunity for interoperability when we have like systems. Uh, in some cases, they're exactly alike. For example, you know, the Australians are buying HIMARS, they're buying Blackhawks, they're buying 47s, uh, Apaches, M1 tanks. There is, there's almost an interchangeability that comes from that because you have similar platforms, you have similar parts, you have similar organic industrial base needs, you can shorten your supply lines, but then if you even have similar capabilities, not exactly the same, there is also an interoperability that is gained from that because now you're doing procedural and technical interoperability. There's three levers of interoperability, human, technical, and procedure. Now you're doing procedural and technical interoperability because you have forces that are training together. And I think one of the things where the Army provides a degree of staying power on those interior lines is through training. Many of these, in fact, I see Gil Ferguson out there, many of these armies also, like we do, produce the bulk of their special operations forces. So here's another uh, aspect of the interoperability between Army for forces in the region, U.S. Army forces, and special operations forces that are in each one of these countries. Again, these are all really important parts of what I refer to as the tr strategic land power network, which is actually the security architecture that binds the region together. And I know that makes some people feel uncomfortable, but I am convinced of it because of my time out there. There is no other way to describe it, but that is essentially the counterweight to what the Chinese are doing. And what are they doing? They're violating their air and maritime littorals. Why? Because they want to control key terrain. And this is what we can do, is we can deny them that terrain. Because why? Because we're interoperable with land forces in the region and because we can also now from the land do sea control, sea denial with the systems that we are beginning to employ. This is a really, really important point. So in many ways, we can make the air power and the maritime power of the United States appear larger than it actually is. Why? Because we can go into a place like the Luzon Strait or the Malacca Strait or the Sunda Strait or the Lombok Straits and control those maritime spaces from the land, or at least deny them. This is an important element of what we're doing out there. Listen, the fact of the matter is the United States Navy and the United States Air Force must keep the global commons open. We cannot do that. Army forces aren't built to do that. So we have to have an unbelievably powerful Navy, and we have to have an unbelievably powerful Air Force. But the interdependencies of the joint force are reliant on what the land power network provides in Asia. And we, as I said earlier, we concede no domain out there. And we concede no terrain. And therefore, that's why it's so important to have these interdependencies highlighted in the things we're doing. That's why training, educational exchanges, leader development exchanges, and then the interoperability exchanges that go on with the equipment that we use with one another is so vitally important to bringing that network together as a counterweight to the things that are happening. All right, so 
the land power network, General Flynn talked about it. We talked with uh, General Lanive about the criticality of the relationships and, and all the, the, the partner nations. Uh, Representative Whitman, from the, con the, the legislative branch side, what can be done to better facilitate the collaboration between our Army and those allies in the region from, from Congress and uh, outreach to other countries? You know, with critical allies like Japan, Australia, South Korea, and others. Sure. Well, there are a couple of things. One is, you know, we have some existing agreements that have lots of potential, things like the Quad, which is Japan, India, uh, Australia, the United States. I think the relationships there begin with economic relationships. What are we going to do to enhance that? Those nations are looking for the economic advantage of being a partner with the United States. That's the easiest way to be able to kind of push off the Chinese, because the Chinese are the bully in the neighborhood. Listen, and the way they operate is they are they are transactional coercionists. I mean, when they look to enter into an agreement with another country, it is purely for the Chinese Communist Party's advantage. It's not for that country's advantage. So how do we build more of those relationships? How do we start there with an economic relationship that then goes into a strategic relationship? That's what countries are looking for. They're saying, hey, listen, if we're not going to be with China, we're going to be with you. Tell us how the relationship with the United States serves their needs in the long term. So we have to be very focused on that. And then we have to look at what are we going to do to protect them? Because they live in a, in, a, in a neighborhood now where the Chinese are bullies and the Chinese will look to bully them. So they want to know what are you going to do to protect us and what are you going to do to make sure that our economies can continue to grow in that particular region? Because they look at the economic power of China and they're concerned about that. Those are things that, that the United States Congress can do in the policies that we adopt and the things that we do in working with those nations making sure, too, we're looking at existing relationships. When I've traveled there, uh, it's interesting to me how the countries that we meet with, whether it's the Philippines, South Korea, Japan, Vietnam, you name it, for, the first thing they ask is, how can we have an agreement like AUKUS? Because we want more of an agreement. Folks in that neighborhood are really concerned about the growing power of China and the influence that they have. So they want these deeper uh, relationships. They want them to be both strategic and economic. So Congress can make sure that we send the clear message about what we're doing, both from a, if you want to call it soft power, call it from a soft power standpoint. But what are we going to do to back that? with hard power. What are we going to do to make sure we have those nations back? What are we going to do to make sure that we say, hey, we want to have that deeper economic relationship with you? That's what they look for. And they will easily, easily, without a lot of convincing, stand with the United States if they believe that we will have their back and if we believe that we will grow an economic relationship with our economy and their economies. And one, I'll, you know, yeah. Go ahead. kind of to Chris here uh, on uh, the Congressman point, one of, uh, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a number of things that are going quite well out there. I mean, I know I'm, you know, painting a picture of a, a, a very aggressive China and, and on a sort of historical or Herculean path of, of an arsenal that they've created. But, but, but I will tell you, there's a, there's a number of bright spots that are ongoing. So, you know, last year in May, the uh, Japanese Chief of Army and the Iraq Chief of Army sat a panel with myself and the Australian Chief of Army. The fact that the Chiefs of Army of those two countries, if you think about the history here, sat a panel together at LANPAC is telling, okay? Um, let me give you a couple of other examples. Indonesia, we had, a, we've had a long exercise with them for uh, you know, north of, of uh, 20 years, um, Garuda Shield, two years ago, that went from an army-to-army -army exercise um, to, uh, to 12 nations uh, and north of 8,000 uh, all-domain, all-service uh, forces uh, participating there. Talisman Sabre in Australia, 10 years ago, that was an army-to-army -army exercise. Two years ago, that was 15 nations 30,000 people. This morning, just this morning, I met with the uh, uh, Malaysian Chief of Army. We have an exercise called Kara Strike with them. And uh, the Australians are sending a company, and Japan is sending observers. And I could go, uh, you know, the, uh, Japan and the Philippines just signed an agreement. We have a strategic comprehensive uh, partnership with Indonesia. We have a strategic comprehensive partnership with Vietnam. I guess the point I'm making here is that the multilateral activities and the increase in multinational exercises from just service to service, country to country, 
to multinations is, uh, is an indicator of the effect that we're having in the region. Now, there's two parts to that. You know, sometimes I just say, you know, give China the mic and let them keep talking because they just, they just, the rhetoric out of them sometimes is so irritating that it creates conditions for our success. And what that leads to is greater participation in multinational exercises when they were just prior, you know, bilateral exercises. And the value of that, to the congressman's point, at least from the Army's standpoint, is, you know, our gain is through campaigning. And again, the campaigning that I'm talking about in Operation Pathways is we've always and long had more than 40 Army to Army and joint exercises across the span of the year. There's a, there is a known cadence to the things that we're doing. The difference is an increase in multilateral activities, an increase in multinational participation, and we are the benefactors in the Army, because the Army has moved some money to help us and Congress has moved some money to help us, is we have an increased amount of resources, the means to do the campaigning. Now, do we have a way to go? Yes, we have a way to go. We still don't have the positional advantage that is necessary and needed out there, but you know, this is where the dime of the US government has to come together, again, with the consent and invitations of our allies and partners in the region. We're not doing anything out there unless they approve of what we're doing. So, uh, but they feel the pressure, and uh, that pressure is manifesting in them having a, a greater sense of collective commitment and unity, unity, and that is demonstrated in those increased multinational exercises that we're doing. General Flynn, I know you exercise this regularly. You, you've talked about it, but as you uh, are, are there gaps, like known gaps, in the intra-theater movement and sustainment of maneuver forces, especially considering, yeah. uh, you know, in a contested uh, yeah. uh, the, the expected targeting of like joint air assets, yep. airfields, ports, and those types of things. Yep. And if so, kind of what are the options for addressing those? Yeah. So two two uh, two part answer one. And I talked about this a little bit. I always, General Helwig has heard me say this, you know, we're the service without a ride. So we have to uh, do very tight coordination between our internal transportation that we have with watercraft, but also Army Material Command, Air Mobility Command, and then the other services and the assets that we have in theater to move around. Um, we have to be very uh, deliberate and thoughtful in our uh, load plans. Um, we have to be able to be pretty nimble by getting back and forth between uh, ports and airfields to be able to, uh, 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 to, be able to move quickly. Um, contracting command as part of what we're doing out there and making sure we have some creative means uh, to create contracts on the ground for things like fuel, um, transportation, parts distribution, uh, and just local support. The other thing I would tell you is... Um, Moving out in the Pacific, and, uh, and, I, and I would uh, also in Korea because of the, when you, when you disaggregate your forces in the continental United States and then you have to come into uh, multiple airfields uh, or multiple airports and uh, seaports, and then you have to re-aggregate your forces. You've got to work with customs. You've got to work with their equivalent of the FCC. FAA, you got to open up air routes, you got to open up ground law, you got to work with the police, you got to know where their hospitals are for medevac, and then you got to, you know, get those forces off of those air pods and C pods and get out into a tactical assembly area. That, my friends, that is like real operational and strategic readiness. You don't get the same experience when you go to Louisiana or California as you're trying to do that in three or four foreign countries across the Indo-Pacific. It's just not the same experience. So what I always talk about is those are a series of tactical actions by very junior soldiers, non-commissioned officers, warrant officers, and officers that are actually solving operational and strategic challenges. The operational and strategic challenge is the operational maneuver to position forces, to be distributed, to be networked, 
to put lethal and non-lethal forces in the right locations, but our ability to actually have the organizational agility to do those tactical actions that are solving operational and, and strategic challenges of movement. This is also where we have to work with the ACE concept from uh, uh, PACAF and the US Air Force. Their limb facts are protection, fuel, and ammunition. So there, we, we have a, a match made in how they're gonna have um, agile combat employment, and we are going to have to look for those ways to be able to distribute logistics and to be able to put security forces in place so that we can open and close these locations where they're either gonna have a hub or a spoke and so they can generate air power. We need that air power and they need that land power for that, for that synergy to be brought together. Uh, hey, sir, can I yeah, yeah, jump go ahead. in a little bit? Because, you know, I was a cog at JRTC for, for uh, two years. Uh, what we ask a brigade, if they're the Korea Rotational Force, to do when they, when they hit the pen is much different than what we would do uh, during our rotation. Uh, we, we use multiple ports. We use multiple uh, A-pods to bring them in, to marry them up with their equipment that's been sent over, and to get them up uh, in their you know, positions as fast as possible. And we purposely look to exercise this at different locations uh, every nine months so we can ensure that, one, we're, we're not patterning ourselves, but uh, we have multiple options to be able to utilize uh, these uh, these entry points, but I, we're also uh, looking very differently as the as the Army uh, Forces Korea Commander. I'm also the senior mission commander for the multiple locations that we have uh, U.S. Army soldiers and families live in, and we're looking at those uh, camps very differently. Their power projection platforms and what assets that we're going to have in place uh, at the right time, at the right uh, you know moment for our war fighters as they're as they're coming into the theater, and we exercise that uh, every nine months with the Korea Rotational Force, and then we exercise it uh, with our sea lanes of communication and our air, air uh, you know, lanes of communication when we do the EDRI. And the EDRI pulls out our forces, you know, our, our platforms out of APS, but we also have, we exercise at the end of that something that's critical and it's, it's often uh, overlooked. And it's a uh, component where we fix the equipment in theater. It's, a, it's an incredible capability. We call it MSCK. Uh, but this capability, we can strip uh, our you know, uh, largest platforms down to the bare minimum and rebuild them in order to get them back into the fight as fast as possible. And we exercise that every time we go through the, uh, the EDRI uh, operations. Congressman yeah, Whitman, you wanted to add? Yeah, I do, do want to add that. Uh, General Fling bring, brings up a great point. I think one of the most important aspects of what we have to do, that is what Congress has to do that doesn't make the headlines, is what are we doing with sea lift and airlift? I mean, we have to be able to get, get the Army and the Marine Corps to be able to move around in theater. And, and it takes big ships to do that and big aircraft to do that, in addition to intra-theater lift. The place that hasn't received the necessary attention because it, it doesn't it doesn't have a home other than in transcom and transcom has been 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 <laughs> been ringing the bell ringing the bell for years and saying by the way let's get this done you know recently we see 17 ships that don't have enough uh merchant mariners on board i mean that's that's incredible you know we we can't keep doing this because we're going to be whistling past the graveyard we have to put the emphasis on sea lift and we have to get back in the business of building ourselves purpose-built logistics ships. You know, listen, it's great. We bought a few used row rows. The price of row rows today, that is roll off, roll on ships, has gone up significantly because of the demand around the world. I would argue we're probably better off building our own ships that are purpose-driven for the mission they are at hand. And we have to do that now. We have to do that now. Congress has to emphasize this. Appropriators have to emphasize this. No matter all the great things that both General Neve and General Flynn do, they're in theater, Operation Pathways and otherwise. Listen, if we can't get to the fight, if we can't move things around in the fight, if we can't, if we can't generate capability and, and capacity in mass, then guess what? It doesn't matter how good we are, how good we train. Yeah. That's one of those critical linchpins. And you know, we're asking Transcom to, to perform the impossible <laughs> mission today. Congress has got to step forward and provide them the resources and the authorization to say, 
go get it done. And this nation can do that. We've been out of that business for a while. We got to get back in that business. We've shown with these maritime security ships or training ships that we produced in Philadelphia that we can do this. We also have potentially uh, a partnership now with a, uh, a South Korean company that can build ships here. We got to get back in that business. Thank you, Representative Whitman. So I, I knew this was going to happen. We, we have more questions than we have time. <laughs> And so we're gonna, I'm gonna, there's one final question yeah. before we, we go with the closing comments here from all of our distinguished panel members. And this one's for you, General Lanive. Uh You mentioned that you uh, wished you could have been in the Pacific before. What do you see or do in Korea now that makes it so special? And what do we have to do to focus on the future for the next 8th Army commander in the future? Yeah, well, first, uh, thanks for the last question. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Sure. Um, General Flynn got his share. So that's <laughs> yeah, so uh, the, the first thing I'd say for the next 8th Army commander, we should give them every tool, uh, every new system in order to test their, that, that truly is uh, a transformation and contact. There's no greater place to be able to execute that uh, than with the, uh, the war fighters uh, that are on the pen. Um, I think one of the things that makes the, this assignment so special, but very, very different than anything I've done before, whether in Forcecom or, or other units, is a singular purpose every single day uh, getting up. We're, we are focused um, not just to the north, but we're focused in multiple directions ensuring that we are a credible deterrent. It doesn't really matter if we talk at all today. If we can't wake up in the middle of the night and fight, Yep. and hold the line until everything we just talked about gets there, then there would be a lot of people that will never forgive us uh, forever. So um, our number one uh, focus is actually ensuring that we're ready across every one of the domains that we have uh, on the pen to be able to answer uh, the call if needed. And, and I'd say uh, to throw every new resource at us, uh, and we're willing to take everything you got here at AUSA, and test it out over there uh, and assure that we have the right systems in place for what we're gonna face. All of it, I, I'd say the last thing is all of it's linked. I, I've never seen it more clearly before in any time in my career. Uh, all, of it, all of our threats are linked together and that's really what keeps me up at night. Yeah. All right, I appreciate all the audience questions and, and everything that, uh, that you were bringing to, to, to bring out a great discussion here. So what I'd like to do now is uh, we'll start with uh, Congressman Whitman and, and go to final comments from the panel members. So, sir, over to you. We're very good. Pete, thanks you, and thank you, and thanks again to AUSA for this great forum. Folks, if we put all of this in context, the things that we have to do, if you look today at where we are as a globe, it's very similar to where I believe the world was in 1939. You see today the rise again, unfortunately, of axes of evil. You see them beginning to operate with each, with each other, just like we saw in World War II. This is a precarious time for the world. Listen, I think that we're up for the challenge, but let's make no mistake about the magnitude of the challenge that we face, and that this is really gonna take every aspect of what we bring to bear, and it has to be done at the speed of relevance. And we really need everybody to speak to this, to the American people, to talk about the magnitude of this threat. And we have to make sure, too, that we understand that it's not just resources that it'll take. It's not just the checkbook. It's also the ability for us to make sure we have our friends and our partners there as part of this. Because just like we saw in 1939, it was not the United States that did that alone. It was our European allies. It was our Indo-Pacific allies. That's what it's going to take today to make sure that we counter this. And listen, we hope to be able to deter it, but if it comes down to it, we will fight and we will win, and it will be about making sure that we can operate with our friends and having deeper relationships with our friends. I mean, we look at where we are today as a nation. Our checkbook's only so big. This is not the Cold War, folks. Some people say, oh, it's a Cold War. It's not. Cold War is very different. Cold War was against Russia, who didn't have a free and open economy like we did. Uh, we just out-resourced them. We cannot do that today. We have to have our friends and allies there with us, and the good news is that those countries out there look at the world as it is today and they want to be the United States friend. They want to work with us. They want to counter China. We have a built-in advantage with that. 
Let's build upon that. Let's make sure that we have all the wherewithal necessary to deter China, to deter our adversaries around the world. But don't mess with us, because we will kick your ass. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, General Lenave. My favorite part. <laughs> hey, tomorrow, I'll, I'll have an uh, incredible honor to lay a wreath uh, at the Korean War uh, Memorial here in, uh, in D.C. With, with some of our partners. Uh, I tell you, we paid uh, a, heavy, a heavy toll uh, in the peninsula uh, for the gains that we've made uh, with the alliance. It is not the Korea uh, that, uh, you know, your uncles or aunts or, or grandparents served in. It is a different kind. It's a critical, critical uh, component uh, to what is going to uh, be, uh, you know, shaping up potentially uh, in the region. And we have to maintain that positional advantage, our feet on the ground in Asia there to make a difference uh, for what the nation could potentially ask us to do. That position, that uh, relationship is critical for success all the way across Indo-Pacific and for the world. So General Flynn, in this being your last contemporary military <laughs> forum as a, as a four-star leader yeah. in our United States Army, yeah. I just want to give you the final, final word. Uh, thanks. Um, I'll uh, repeat a couple of uh, themes here that I think are uh, really important. Uh, one is that uh, this century, this century is going to be defined by the relationship between the United States and Asia and China. And so the consequences of the threat, the consequences of uh, our success, and I mean our success by way of our freedoms and prosperity, and at least securing our freedoms and prosperity um, in the region, um, is reliant on how we operate uh, in that theater. The, uh, the dangers of the trajectory that that force has been on and continues to be on is one that we have to pay strict attention to and we must slow it down. And in my view, this is why it's so important that we recognize that the, the strategic land power network in Asia is actually the security architecture that binds that region together. And again, I know I've made my argument for three and a half years. I'll continue to make the argument. But it is a central part of being able to create those conditions so that we don't have another limited regional war break out in an area where we can ill afford it to happen. We already have one in Europe and one in the Middle East. We do not need another one out there. The last uh, point I'm going to make, and it's through two stories, and uh, they're both just, you know, humbling to me, is, uh, <clears throat> is through the lens of my experience out there. And I won't name nations, but the first story is I recall uh, taking a, a corps commander of another army in the region to one of our command posts. And in that command post, we had these UAVs flying and full motion video and, you know, all these incredibly um, uh, neat systems in a brigade uh, combat team command post. And... Uh, you know, I was showing them all these things, and they were giving them a briefing, and we walked out of the tent, <clears throat> and uh, I was feeling pretty proud about myself, and I pointed over the soldier, uh, my shoulder, and I said, what did you think of that? And he turned to me, and he said, General, he goes, you know, we'll never be like that. At which time I sort of rocked back on my heels, and I was waiting for the next shoe to drop, and he said, but that's not why you need us. And he pointed over because we had just left their jungle training center, he pointed over to the jungle and he said, that's why you need us. The second story is I was in another country and there were, uh, and the equipment had not shown up for a wide range of reasons, that's another story. The equipment had not shown up and there were mortar teams working with 60 and 82 millimeter mortars. <clears throat> Notice I didn't say 81s. 
<laughs> and they, had, they did not have their mortar ballistic computers. <clears throat> All they had was a plotting board, and, um, and none of them spoke the same language. Our soldiers obviously spoke English, and the other soldiers spoke another language. And a soldier pulled out of his cargo pocket, a, the soldier from the other country, a handheld Texas instrument computer, and he started putting the equations into it, and they were plotting them, and they were firing live rounds on a, uh, on a live fire with an 82 millimeter mortar and a 60 millimeter mortar. None of them could speak the same language. They spoke 11 Charlie. They spoke Mortarman language, okay? And they were doing it all through sign language and just crew drill. And to me, those, those stories are stories of humility that we should have towards the work that we do with our allies and partners in the region, because they are as committed to the protection of their countries, committed to the freedoms and prosperities that they want to secure in their countries, and they look to us for leadership to be able to work together with them to bring these systems together. And they have things that we need to learn, and they have things that they bring to the fight, and we have things that we need to learn, and we have things that we can bring to the fight. And to me, those two stories are, they're both humbling, but they also sort of rock you into your position of why it's so important for our land forces to be a central part of the security architecture that binds Asia together, because that's the role that we play, and that's the critical part of what we do is by bringing these countries together for freedom and prosperity for all. So thanks very much. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Major, Major General Gallagher and members of the panel, thank you for the discussion today. Before we part, please note that AUSA's Education Zone is at the end of the hall. There you can find a variety of papers and educational resources focused on topics much like what we discussed here. By participating, uh, in addition, you can share why you serve by participating in the graphic art illustration or recording an impromptu message by our podcast team. Your message could be released at a later date heard by our 15,000 podcast listeners. Again, thank you for attending, and be sure to check out our Contemporary Military Forums tomorrow.